Please note that this episode contains depictions of violence and sexual assault that some people may find disturbing. In 1997, the year before Dorian Thomas went missing, the North Heights area was booming. But it wasn't new construction or a population surge. It was crime. The area was infested with drugs, causing the crime rate to soar. Prostitution became an option for many users in order to pay for their habits. Robberies and assaults were on the rise. Children were left without parents. Parents were left without children. Like other cities, a rise in drugs also resulted in a rise in violent behavior, including murder. So it's no surprise that North Heights also had a rise in homicides that year. Sadly, most of the cases from that year are still unsolved to this day. But what happens when a group of kids find the body of a woman? And then a year later, one of those kids goes missing. Because that's exactly what happened to Dorian Thomas. This is episode two, The Field Behind the Why. In 1997, North Heights wasn't the only area in Amarillo with these issues. In fact, one of the biggest murder cases in the history of Amarillo occurred in December of 97. 19-year-old Brian Denneke was killed in a deliberate hit-and-run attack by 17-year-old Dustin Camp. The story made national news. Denneke, a punk musician, was intentionally targeted by Camp a preppy kid who came from a wealthy family. Two white boys from different sides of the tracks in what became a battle to the death, with Camp running Denneke over in his father's Cadillac. It was the type of story news stations flocked to. It had all the makings of a viral murder story. It was a media frenzy. At the same time, a series of murders occurred in North Heights. They didn't get the same amount of attention as the Denneke Camp story. No 24-hour news stations coming to find out what happened. No constant chatter about the victims. It was almost like someone wanted these cases to disappear. That the community felt shame over these murders. People made a lot of assumptions about these victims because the area of town they were killed in and the color of their skin. On August 5th, 1997, the body of 45-year-old Gloria Ann Covington was found in the field behind the YMCA in North Heights. Gloria was the mother of four children. My name is Deanna Bassett Weatherton, and I am Gloria's daughter. My mother was a wonderful person, a hard worker, loved her grandkids, kids in general. We asked Deanna about her favorite memories of her mother. Oh, me and her cooking, sleeping together. I was her baby. I'm not the baby, but I was her favorite child, I'm going to (laughs) say. My sister and brothers wouldn't agree, but... Deanna was 20 at the time of her mother's murder. After the events that took place, Deanna moved away from Amarillo to a nearby town. Now she herself is a mother of 10 children. You can hear her children and grandchildren playing in the background during our interview. Deanna told us that the night before her mother was killed, she showed affection to her kids and grandkids in a way she never had before. The night before all this happened, I was at my aunt's spending the night and she came in and she grabbed me. She didn't believe in kissing babies in her mouth. That was the first time I've ever seen her. So she grabbed me, kissed me, told me goodnight. She grabbed my oldest child, Devante, and kissed him in his mouth. Grabbed my baby, who was five months, kissed him, and told me she'll be back. Gloria told Deanna she deserved a break and would babysit for her the next day. Deanna said she was really looking forward to it. But when her mom didn't show up, she began to worry. She woke up her sister and told her that their mother had never shown. Deanna headed to her grandmother's house, which was only a few blocks away. So I went over there and they said, she didn't stay here last night, baby. We we haven't seen her. Later that day, Deanna's nephew came over to invite her to hang out at her grandmother's house 
with a cousin that was in town from California. She had a hard time physically getting out the door. She knew something was wrong. Her body wouldn't move. Finally, she found the strength to head out. I walked through the alley to get to my grandma's and I made it around there and everybody was in a scramble. My grandmother, who was ill, was crying. She was like, my baby, my baby. And I'm looking at everybody crazy, like, what's going on? And I had an aunt down the hallway beating the walls. And I'm like, what's going on? And my oldest aunt said that they had just found my mother dead at the park. I'm telling them that they're crazy. So I goes to the bathroom and took the phone in the bathroom and called my oldest sister. I said, girl, they said something about finding mama at the park. She was like, don't tell me this. And I was like, well, you need to call the police and find out. Well, she called, and they said it was me, that they had found me. And I was like, no, that wasn't me. She was like, yeah, they said it was Deanna. So I'm like, all right. So we both start calling the police department, start talking to detectives. And it was like, well, if you're saying that you're Deanna and it's not you, give us the address. They came over, and I had to identify my mother. My sister still, for some reason, could not leave. She was working at Family Dollar. So when he came and he showed me the picture, y'all just went AWOL crazy. I talked noise to the police, like, y'all better find out who did it. That is my mother, her name is Gloria. So then we sat down about five o'clock and I was like, I see why they thought it was me. She had on my clothes, <laughs> my shorts, a t-shirt and my shoes. So then we get that settled away. My sister finally make it. And I was like, you need to talk to the detectives cause she's the oldest. And she grabs and she was like, yes, that's my mother. If y'all could have seen the scene, it was, it was really bad. You wouldn't want to see your mother like that. It was horrible. That night, Deanna stayed with her grandmother. As the week went on, the case started going cold. I want to say maybe a week after her death, they called us all to the detective's office. And they let us know that whoever did this had there been someone that we knew because of the amount of stab wounds that she had. She had a lot. And to have her in a casket, looking at her arms, because like I said, I'm, the ba- I'm her baby. Her arms look like somebody put battery acid on it, dropped something and burned her arms. Whoever did it, they're they horrible, but they're going to pay. They're going to pay if not here on earth. God got them. Gloria had been stabbed 27 times. She had defensive wounds on her hands from grabbing the knife during the attack. There was a lot of talk at that time about Gloria Covington. Why was she in a park in the middle of the night? Was she on drugs? Was she a sex worker? But you said that she walked everywhere. Everywhere. She worked off of 51st Street. And she would walk from there to her job and be there on time. <laughs> oh wow. my goodness. Yeah. So what did your mom do? She was a dietitian. She worked at the nursing home in the kitchen. According to our estimations, Gloria walked approximately three hours each direction every time she walked to work. I hate this place, I really do. Part of it is because my mother, to hit honest, because in the summer day reports, they said she was a prostitute. That is a lie. From, from where I'm standing, my mother, when she left me that night, she was to go see my baby sister who lived on 9th Street. So, and she walked everywhere. She did not like getting in cars. So for you to say that she was out prostituting that night couldn't have been true because she was trying to get to, her plans was, her and my aunt plotted to move to Oklahoma and was going to leave us here. So... The next day, if she wouldn't have got murdered, she would have been in Oklahoma City. I remember one night, my mother came home. Like I said, she worked out there on 51st. And she was walking home, and she said the police pulled her over. And I was like, Mama, what did they want? 
Oh, he was telling me that I was out here prostituting. If he catch me back out here again, he was taking me in. I'm like, okay. So I got with my kid's father and told him we have to start giving her a ride, making her get in the car. Y'all, my mother would not get in the car. If this happened, because I'm hearing that it was a white pickup and all this tire tracks, and he had to hit her upside the head or something and put her in that car because she would not get in the car. So the next day she came, or she didn't even get to come home. She was in jail for prostitution. So and that's said, why the prostitution thing has come up. She said that the police had assaulted her. Yeah. It's some, it's a lot of stuff. I don't, like I said, I don't trust these polices in Amarillo as far as I can throw them. But you fully believe she was not prostituting. I know for a proven fact she wasn't prostitute. We can, we can go walking with her. There's been times where we had walked from one end of the, the uh, town to another part of the town, and would we'll get stopped by the police with her walking. So yeah, and she wouldn't walk on a dark street. She had to walk where there is light. Wouldn't believe it, but she would take her socks off and fill it up with rocks. So in case somebody tried to attack her or something, she'll be able to beat him. Less than six weeks later, another woman was found dead. On September 11th, 1997, the body of 35-year-old Linda Gell Jackson was found in the 3100 block of North Wilson. Officers found Linda's body lying face down in the street. She was killed when she was struck by a motor vehicle and the case was ruled a homicide. Special Crimes Unit investigators determined that she was assaulted inside of a vehicle prior to her murder. Just like in Gloria's case, Linda was also speculated to be a sex worker in the area. One of Linda's childhood friends was Chris Brashears. My maiden name is Keeler, and I went to school with Linda from the first through the 12th grade. Linda and Chris met at Whittier Elementary, later going on to Travis Junior High and Paladero High School. The two of them played volleyball together for many years. She always had my back and I had hers and she was always smiling. She was just a good person. I mean, I didn't know anybody that didn't like her. She was, as far as I know, from a good family. Chris read about Linda's death in the newspaper. I hadn't, I hadn't seen Linda since we got out of school, but I did run into her older sister one time and I asked about her probably a couple years before Linda died. And her sister told me that she had gotten into some drugs and stuff. And, you know, she said, you'd be mad at her. And I said, you better believe I'm mad at her, you know, and stuff. But that's as far as, you know, as much as she told me. So, you know, when I heard of her death, I was, it was just crushing. You know, I couldn't believe the things that she would gotten involved in and stuff because that, that was not Linda. I mean, I was surprised. I was very shocked. When we interviewed Sergeant Brent Harlan, I asked him if he thought the murders of Gloria and Linda might be connected. I was very familiar with the Glory, Gloria Covington because that happened on the area of town that I rode. Um, the other one, I can't remember her name. You just mentioned Linda it. Jackson. Linda Jackson. There was always speculation from what I remember. Again, I wasn't in special crimes at this time, but there was always speculation that those two may have been related somehow, some way. But from what I know, I, I think the manner of death was different in those two. And I think that they, I'm not gonna say they dispelled that, but I think that there was some belief that there may be two different suspects on those, but I don't know for sure. Even Chris Brashears wondered if there could be some sort of connection between the murders. Yeah, I've always wondered if it was connected to the other girl, the Gloria Covington murder, but I just would look at it as someone that just didn't have any respect for women in general or, Maybe, you know, he disrespected them for what they were doing. I don't know, but I just see a heartless person that was involved in it. I talked with Gloria's daughters about their theories on the two murders being connected. And then the way Linda ended up dead, mm -hmm. it's almost as if it happened again, but in a different place. Because they took her over there on Wilson Street in fact, we did her the same way and just dumped everybody out over there on Wilson. So it's like, 
I think it's all tied in together. Even the detectives, while talking to the detectives, they can they describe to Linda's death and my mother's death the same. And then when it comes to Dorian, they said that they feel like whoever did that to Gloria was the one that kidnapped Dorian. But they don't have any information on that. Deanna talked with one of Linda's daughters after her death. Linda's daughters were both children when their mother was murdered. So I'll never forget the day me and her daughter sat on the porch. She's way younger than me. And she was out there crying, and I asked her what was the matter, and she said, my mama got killed, and I just want her back. And when I told her who my mama was, she told me how my mother and her mother was at her grandmother's house. Oh, so they knew each other. They knew each other real well. We reached out to Linda's daughters, Casey and Christian, for an interview. We were unsuccessful in our attempts to get confirmation with them before the production of this podcast, but we would still love to talk with them. Casey and Christian, if you'd like to talk with us, we're still interested. At the time of Gloria's funeral, there was little evidence as to who had killed her. The family was looking for answers. And as I was born in the house, this lady, Linda, she came up to me and she said, honey, I'm so sorry. I was just with your mother last night. She was like, I can't believe this. But she wanted to talk to me. But I was in shock and I was just overwhelmed and didn't know what to think right then. And not knowing that I wasn't going to ever have the chance to talk to her again, I just told her that this was not the time and I didn't want to hear it. And I walked off and left her standing there. I have a cousin named She was with her too. She told Linda to shut her mouth and she kind of like pushed her away and they walked off together. Then they say, you know, Linda ends up there. So I'm like, maybe if I would have listened to what she had to say, she probably could have gave us some light on to what happened or something, you know? I feel like Linda knew what happened and she knew who did it and they went back in to shut her up. They did, they got rid of her to keep her from talking. Because like I said, the day when I got there, before I even got out the car, that woman came up to that car. I didn't even know her personally. She came up to me and she went to hug me and I was like, in shock and I just told her, I was like, meow. And she went to talking, I was like, I don't want to hear this right now. Because I'm still trying to regulate what everybody's saying and I'm trying to figure stuff out. And I just told her, I don't, this is not the time I don't want to hear it. Would have let me know what happened to her. I regret it so bad, and I listened to the, what that woman had to say to me. Like a lot of people in North Heights at that time, both Gloria and Linda became a product of their environment. They both struggled with substance abuse. Our stepdaddy, she found out that he was on the so she tried it to see what he was getting out of it. And she always said that first hit was the best hit, and you always go back looking for the same high. And that's how she ended up getting on the stuff. So when she tried to get out, it was like a battle she was fighting with. I said my mother was on drugs. What you have? You have a crackhead, you have a smoker, you have a dope fiend. She was a smoker, someone that can go without it. Despite their issues with addiction, these two women were mothers. They were daughters. They didn't deserve to die. They are both important, and their cases deserve to be solved. Dorian and his friends had discovered Gloria's body at the park that day. Brandon Thomas remembers the day Dorian told him about the incident. Brandon had gone to live with family members in Colorado after his mom had gotten in trouble with the law. She went to state jail, and while she was incarcerated, the boys were separated and sent to live with different family members. I mean, when I first got home, that was the first thing he told me. He was like, yeah, we found a dead body. Like... Wow, he was like, it was ain't Gloria, because we knew Gloria. My mom and her, they almost looked identical, so they, every time Gloria came around, she would give us candy and call my mom a twin. 
Madison and I couldn't believe it when Brandon told us that Gloria and his mom looked like twins. What are the odds of Dorian finding the body of a woman in the neighborhood that looked exactly like his mother? We asked Deanna about their similarities. And Brandon had told us that um, your mom and his mom, that they called them twins because they looked a lot alike. That's crazy. I'm glad Brandon said something because they do. They did. They look a lot alike. I used to, I still do. I tease my aunties and uncles. (laughs) I tell them, you sure your daddy is your daddy? (laughs) I think grandma been out there. (laughs) Yeah. Brandon went on to tell us more about what Dorian had told him. And there's another detail that a lot of people don't know, and I don't know why they're leaving it out, but apparently there were supposed to be two bodies back there. With Gloria? One, her and somebody else, a man. Really? Dorian, that's what Dorian said? This is what he tells me. Oh my gosh. So they found two people? He said it was her and a fat white man. Madison and I were both completely shocked yet again. We both sat there with our mouths open in disbelief. This was information we had absolutely never heard before. We interviewed Sergeant Brent Harlan back in August of 2021. We asked him if he knew about Dorian and his friends finding Gloria. That I do not know. Yeah, it was uh, actually north of the North Branch Y up there off Northwest 18th. There's a low spot back there, and that's where Gloria was found. And, you know, those kids all over the neighborhood, that, that, that is a distinct possibility, but I do not know who found her. We also asked Sergeant Harlan if there was a white man found with Gloria. There was a man with Gloria when she was found? Yes, like that he was also deceased. Oh, no. No, no, no. There was, well, I say that, but I'm 99.9% sure no, because I think she was found up there alone. Although Sergeant Harlan denies a man being found with Gloria, her daughter Deanna actually heard a similar story from Dorian himself. I knew Dorian because his mother, my mother, and a lot of my family members, my mother's age, they all grew up together. When this happened to my mother, we at the time didn't know that Dorian was the one. And Pam came to my my aunt's house. And Dorian was like, I'm the one that found my Aunt Anne. Is she all right? And he was asking questions, and he said that her brain was laying right beside her head. Dorian got to talking a little too much because he started talking. He said that her brain was laying there. She was naked, but some feet over, there was a white man laying there. And Pam snatched him out the house and told him he was talking too much to get in the car. Let's go. That was the last thing I heard of Dorian. Pam could have just been protecting Dorian from sharing any information about what he had seen. But what if he had seen a man with Gloria? Who could it have been? And where was his body? I feel like Dorian disappeared because he was over there with the family that day. And he told us that he was the one that found her body. And he said that when he went out there to that park, that there was another person laying out there beside her, but nobody never said anything else about this other person. So I was, it was in my mind that maybe the other person wasn't dead. Maybe he was hurt or something and he just wasn't dead. And he seen Dorian when he came out there and Dorian was able to identify him. So maybe that's what happened to Dorian. I don't know, but that's the way I always felt. If there was a white man with Gloria, who was it? Was it someone prominent? A police officer? Someone wealthy? Was there a cover-up involved? Also, Brandon Thomas brought up a great point when we talked about Dorian finding Gloria's body. One thing somebody did point out was that a lot of people seemed to know that he was one of the kids that found the body back there, but nobody has the name on the other two people. And how that became to be, nobody seems to know. And that's kind of weird, don't you think? That, like, everybody knows he was involved, but not the other two kids. He's right. I don't know the names of the other kids who were involved. Only Dorian, the kid who went missing a year later. 
the kid whose mom looked like the twin of the woman who was murdered? Would we know the names of the other boys if the same thing had happened to one of them instead? At the same time, there are still members of the community who don't know that Dorian was one of the kids who found her. In September of 1998, just a few weeks before Dorian's disappearance, there was a third female victim. According to charlieproject.org, the victim was assaulted in a light blue truck. She escaped and ran to a nearby apartment where she screamed for help. That apartment belonged to Pam Thomas, Dorian's mother. Brandon Thomas remembers the incident. This is when we're staying on 9th and Lipscomb. I can't exactly recall what time it was, but I know it had to be like early in the morning, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Everybody's in the house asleep. Next thing you know, somebody's beating on the door, hollering and screaming. So my mom opens the door and there's this lady, no clothes on, bloody from head to toe. And she was like, uh, he tried to kill me, he tried to kill me. And I, I ran all the way down to your house. And um, she explained the same dude, a white redheaded man in a truck, tried to like beat her to death. And she just got out the car and just took off running. And from where we stayed to where she ran was probably about three blocks, nonstop. The woman survived the assault, but sadly, she passed away a couple of years ago. So the question remains, was the man who assaulted the third victim the same man who murdered Gloria and Linda? Was it the same man who took Dorian? Or were these all separate incidents that just happened to occur around the same time in the same neighborhood? One Saturday, I went to the library to do research. I had a stack of microfilm. I was looking for articles relating to all of the cases. My focus for the past few hours had been finding a high profile white man that died the same week as Gloria. I checked every obituary searching for prominent people. I finally reached the last roll in the stack without any luck. I had been there for hours already. My eyes were starting to get tired from reading and scrolling. I grabbed the film and I tried to put it on the spindle and it wouldn't go on. I checked the roll, it looked fine, nothing was obstructing it, and it wouldn't go on. I kept trying and trying and minutes passed by and this last roll of film would not go on. But then I thought, maybe this is a test. Maybe it's a test of my patience, my will. So I took a breath, I grabbed the film, and it went right on. And then I thought to myself, I feel like the universe was testing me to see if I'd give up. I scrolled to the date of Gloria's death. And of course, I didn't find anything because in 1997, the article wouldn't be printed in the news until the following day. When I got to August 6th, 1997, my eyes stopped on an article titled, Wife of Man Jailed in Assault found dead in park. As I read the article, I got chills down my spine. Dorian claimed there was a white man next to Gloria when she was found. Was this the article pointing me to the person involved in a cover-up? Cover up, cover up, cover up, cover up. Next time on What Happened to Dorian Thomas. Robert came on first. And then Mama came across there. They showed her body laying on the ground with the cover over her. The angry black kid who had to go through a system ended up being 70% of the population in those prisons from Amarillo. And we only made up 7% of the population in the city as a whole. Tell you, that's the reason why I moved out of Amarillo. If you couldn't protect my mother, then you can't protect me. What Happened to Dorian Thomas is a Macabre Club production. Written and produced by me, Amy Hart. Co-produced by Madison Fowler. 
Sound design by Juan Duran. If you have any information about the disappearance of Dorian Thomas or the murders of Gloria Covington or Linda Jackson, please contact the Amarillo Police Department's Cold Case Unit at 806-378-9446. Please help us share Dorian, Gloria, and Linda's stories. You can help by rating, reviewing, and sharing our podcast. Plus, if you'd like to help support us, please join us on Patreon. You can get early access to new episodes, a private community to discuss the cases, and live Q&As with the creators. Please click the link in our bio for more information. Thank you for listening.